Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to take a look at the CHIP, which is a $9 single board computer from the Next Thing company. And for your $9 you even get some onboard storage, which is pretty good, isn't it? So let's go and take a closer look. So, here we have the chip in the anti-static bag in which it arrives. You can hopefully see on there it says what a bag of chip. Can you see that? There we are. Bag of chip for $9. Not bad for a computer, is it? So uh, let's uh, get inside. Take the thing out the anti-static bag. I can't even get into an anti-static bag. Surely I won't be defeated by such a simple piece of uh, unpackaging. And uh, here we are. This is the chip. A really tiny, weeny, matchbox-sized computer. Now, if I turn the thing over, we'll start with the specs looking on the back, because on the back we have the processor, the system on a chip sitting in the middle there. And the chip here is an all-winner R8, which includes a 1 GHz ARM Cortex A8 CPU and an ARM Mali 400 GPU. And just beneath this chip, you can see down here we have some memory. This is a 512 megabytes, a half a gigabyte, of RAM, and I'm assured that this is a Samsung RAM and it's a DDR3. Now if we turn the board over, you can obviously see this stuff on top of the board as well. Uh, let's look at some of the chips here. The first chip maybe to look at is uh, this one. This chip here is the onboard flash storage, 4 gigabytes of onboard storage. Now, let's have a look at some of the other chips here. If we move down a little bit, you can see, well, I'm going that way there. Uh, we've got two other chips here. We've got over here, this is a power management chip, and you've got to have a power management chip to make your board work. This is an AXP209, if you particularly care about that. But you're probably more interested in the module we have over here. This is a wireless networking module. This is an RTL8723BS, and this gives you onboard Bluetooth 4 and onboard Wi-Fi 802.11b, G and N, which is clearly very handy. Also on this side of the board, you will see we have got a 2mm JTS PH battery connector, which means if you want, you can power the chip from a 3.7 volt lithium polymer uh, LiPo battery. And there's even a charging circuit in this if you power it via the 5 volt connector I'll show you in a second. Also on this side of the board, finally to point out, we have got a power button, a reset button, which is sitting just there. Turning to the other end of the board, we've got some connectors. Not least you'll see we've got a full-size USB 2 connector, just one of them, but we have got USB on this board. And we've got a micro USB connector for connecting 5 volt power. Although apparently it is possible to reconfigure that for other purposes if you're using the uh, other power connector on the other end of the board. Also here, we've got a 3.5 mm TTRS or tip ring ring sleeve AV jack. And this allows us to connect the chip to a composite monitor and to stereo audio. Although again, it is possible to reconfigure this socket so you can use it for a microphone and stereo audio if you're getting your video from an add-on card. You can just change that over by doing some solder connections on the board. I'll say a bit more about how you use this connector in a few minutes time. And finally to note, on the end of this board, the chip also has two tiny little LEDs which are just in here, which are used for power and indicating what is going on with the chip. Finally, and as you can't have failed to have noticed unless you came out this morning wearing your dark black I don't want to see anything glasses, on the top of the chip we have two 40-pin headers here and here. They sort of really stand out, don't they? And they give you lots of connectivity. From those pins, you've got things like AV connectors, power connectors, you can connect in an LCD display, you've got eight readily available GPIO pins, what they call XIO pins. So although the chip is a fully blown computer, clearly it's got a lot of microcontroller opportunities given its size and its price, and you've got all that connectivity on these headers. Often with a computer like this, people say to me, what about a case? How would you keep this thing all in nice good condition? How would you protect the processor on the bottom of the, of the chip board? And the answer to that is that they do actually sell a little case for $2. It's here, if I can get it out of its little, uh, little bag. Let's try and get out that for you. So 
So I, I spent the extra two dollars to get the case in the bag, which is completely impossible to open. I can't get into the bag. What's going on? You must be able to get in the bag, Christopher. There we are. And here it is. And I wouldn't exactly call it a case myself, although that's what they sell it as. It's a piece of plastic which you can uh, fit your chip on top of. I think it goes on like, um, like this and uh, holds like that. Oh, it works quite nicely actually. And that just gives you a bit of support. So it just has one screw goes in. Unfortunately, the screw supply, they give you two screws, look, but the screw is self-tapping. Don't like that, but I will uh, fit that. And then we'll think about connecting this thing up. Right. I've now screwed the chip into its small plastic case thing and uh, very nice it looks there, all uh, protected on the back with its piece of plastic. And it's now time therefore to connect things to it and to show you what it can do. So first of all, we need some sort of a mouse and keyboard device. And so I'm going to use this, which is my Rye i8. And the reason I'm going to use this, it's the only device I own that combines a keyboard and a mouse device into one device with one USB connection via this little dongle. So I will connect the dongle into the front of the chip. Of course, it's one USB connector. There it is. I have tried the chip with all sorts of different keyboards and mice, and they work perfectly well. But because you've got one USB connector here, you are going to need a hub um, preferably a powered hub, or most certainly a powered hub, if you're going to use standard keyboard and mice with the chip. So in this case, the Rai i8 is a useful choice. Having said that, of course, once things are running, the chip does have its onboard Bluetooth, so you could use a Bluetooth mouse and or a Bluetooth keyboard. That would work perfectly well. Now, you're also going to need to use a power adapter, of course. This is a standard USB 5 volt power adapter. So let's get this uh, on wired. This happens to be a 1.5 amp adapter. I've found that works perfectly well. They do recommend a 2 amp power adapter, but I've had no problem with 1.5, although I've tried two, 2 amps too. So we'll take that and also connect it in to the chip like that. So that's going to give us power and a mouse keyboard functionality. And then finally, we need to connect to the 3.5 millimeter jack, a cable which will take out the uh, composite video and audio. And you must remember this is a four pole 3.5 millimeter jack, one of the less common kind, and the lead is more difficult to get hold of. Now, they will sell you one, of course, from Nextinko when you buy your chip, but you might have one lying around. I did have a lead lying around. In fact, I had two of these leads lying around, which have on one end the four pole jack and on the other end, three phono connectors. I found the leads were wired different ways around. There is no standard way, let's get that out of the way, there's no standard way to wire these connectors. And even here on a lead that will work, um, here it's not the right colours, which doesn't really matter, but you'd expect normally uh, yellow would be your video connector. Here red is the video connector, and yellow and white are the, are the audio connectors. And if you look at this diagram, you'll see how it's things you need to be wired up in terms of the tip and the two rings and the sleeve to wire your connector to use composite video and audio from your chip. So I'll just connect that into the chip. That goes in there like that, and our chip is now ready to be booted up. Right, so here we are sitting in the dark and I'm going to boot up the chip. So I'll hit the switch by the power adapter. There we are, you probably heard that, and the chip should now be booting up. Yes, there it is, we can see a little chip on the screen. I'll show you the whole boot up sequence, I won't speed through this so you can see how fast a chip is. Now currently we're watching a chip connected via the composite video output I showed you in the last segment. And it's important to note that by default a chip uses the NTSC composite video system, which is the composite video system used in the United States and some other parts of the world. So if you're in the United States you should be able to buy a chip, plug it into a television or a monitor with a composite video input, it'll work fine. However, if you're in, say, a PAL region of the world, it uses the PAL video system like the UK, you may struggle. I've tried today again and again and again to get a chip to output a standard PAL composite video signal, and I failed. And other people I found on the internet have failed as well. So do be aware of that. I'm lucky that my monitor here will take a NTSC video signal. I can't record one other than by pointing a camera at it, but at least I can see the picture. But if you're not in an NTSC video region, do be aware you may have problems using the composite output on the chip. Anyways, you can now see the chip is booting up. 
the picture won't look brilliant because A, I'm pointing a camera at the screen, and B, we're running from a composite video signal with a resolution of 640 by 480 pixels. But it does work. Here we are on the chip desktop, and the chip operating system that I'm sure you would get is a Linux distribution, it's a Debian distribution which has been customised for the chip, and at the top here we have computer things in pink, and if we click on that you'll see all sorts of things are pre-installed. We've got some Office packages pre-installed, the Abbey Word web processor, the Junivaric spreadsheet, and there's an internet stuff here, we've got a Firefox web browser which is sort of branded as Ice Weasel down there, but it's definitely Firefox, I've tried it out. There's a couple of games there, there's various accessories, all sorts of settings. There is a setting here for display, if I can find it again, there it is, but it wouldn't help me get to PAL video output unfortunately. And there's also up here a file manager. If I go into that, I, I do like the look of this. It's very retro computing, isn't it? I, I really like the chip for, for that. And if I click on a file system, you will see if I just leave my cursor there, we've got a 3.2 gigabytes free out of the 3.8 gigabytes onboard storage. So even with the operating system and some programs installed, you've got quite a lot of space to work with on the chip. So there we are. That's the basis of what you get when you boot up a chip. So, as we've seen, by default the chip connects to a monitor using its composite video connector, this 3.5mm jack. However, the next thing co who make the chip do make a range of what they call dual inline packages or DIPs that allow you to connect the chip to an HDMI or a VGA monitor. And here, as you can see, I've got the HDMI DIP. This costs so $15, it's $10 if you want the VGA one. So I thought we'd have a go using this. First of all, to get in here, we'll take a, a label off, quite an important label, which has got some important instructions. We'll come back to that in a second, but hopefully I can get in without damaging that too much. Yes, I think I can, and hopefully, dear me, getting in there. There we are, getting in, and it's all wrapped up in pink foam. Oh, come off some pink foam. There we are, eventually. Aha, here we are. Here is the uh, HDMI dip for the chip, and I guess this is must have connected us, presume, presume, onto that, which is going to be quite sharp. This is a, oh, there we are, yes. Whoa, vicious looking thing, isn't it? This is the, uh, the dip for the chip for HDMI. So uh, there it is, look, and this will obviously fit on the, uh, the top of the chip to give it a HDMI capabilities. But before we put that on, I do need to know, as I said a second ago, what's on the label here, which tells us we have to update the chip before we can use the DIP, the HDMI adapter. And to do that, you need to go to a Chrome web browser and go to updates.getchip.com. It has to be the Chrome web browser, apparently, and you install an app and you install some drivers when you go through to a page for, for flashing the chip. And once you've done that, you take your chip and you have to put a jumper in, a piece of wire, even a bent paper clip if you like, between a couple of uh, the pins and one of the headers, and you plug in a micro USB cable, and then you plug the chip into your computer by a standard USB cable on the other end, and it will appear and it'll detect the thing, and then you can go through a process of selecting the particular version of the chip operating system you need, it has DIP support, and that will download and install on your chip as you're seeing here. And I have to admit, it's a bit of a fraught process, it doesn't work perfectly first time, some of the Windows drivers are a bit flaky, they keep failing to, to work properly, but eventually I got it to work. It's one point said it would take well over two hours, but it took me about half an hour to go through the process, and I've now got my chip hopefully set up to do that. So the chip we've got here has been through the flashing process, so we're all ready in theory to take the uh, HDMI dip and to fit it on top of a chip. It's exciting, isn't it, all this? So I think it goes on that way around, so you end up with the, um, the connectors for USB and power at one end and the HDMI connector at the other. So um, basically I just put that thing on top like that and give it a nice gentle press down. This is a case of doing things very carefully, I think. Oh, there we are. Did it hopefully carefully there, and that, that's done. You can see now why the case is only on the bottom of the chip, because the top is now occupied by the, the HDMI adapter. So this is now ready to uh, use again, and I think we'll now see if we can boot up the chip with its uh, HDMI dip on the top.
Right, well here I am again running the chip. You can see it's all connected up there with the HDMI dip on the top and the flashing its lovely pink LEDs. And if we look back on the screen, we're now running in a 1280 by 720 resolution, which is a, a bit nicer to, uh, to work in. If I go up to uh, Computer Things, we've got the same menu as before. It's not quite got the same uh, retro feel as it had in, in this uh, improved resolution, but it's much more usable. Let's just uh, show you a few more things of what Chip can do now we've actually got it uh, running here. Um, there's things like the, uh, the spreadsheet. I bet you're dying to see the spreadsheet. Let's just launch that up, see if that works. It's, uh, yes, there we are. You see, we could do lovely spreadsheet stuff on the, on the chip if we wanted to, but uh, I don't think I will right now. And the thing you're probably more interested to see is the web browser. Let's run up the, uh, the web browser. This is a version of Firefox, I'm pretty certain. So that'll run up. Might take a second or two. But uh, no, there it is. Thought it wasn't going to arrive, but it is going to arrive. Definitely Firefox. Look, we can see that on the uh, Firefoxy logo-y thing. Let's uh, maximize that. Um, that's all very exciting, but I think I'll go and uh, go to my history and we'll uh, drop down and nip off to one of my own websites. I always do that, don't I, just to show you a website works. There we are. We're online with the Explaining the Future website. And it all seems to work. So you can see you can have a reasonable browsing experience on a chip. Yes, it definitely, definitely works. What's it doing there? I don't want to go into read of you. Don't you wish web browsers stopped trying to be clever these days? They could just get on being web browsers rather than all that other stuff. But uh, there we are. We're now proving to ourselves that we can use the chip with its uh, HDMI dip on top, makes it more usable, but probably slightly less exciting to some extent. But there we are. The chip, definitely a workable and working single board computer. There can be no doubt whatsoever that for $9, the chip delivers some fantastic computing value. Now, absolutely, you have to add on certain things to make it work, a power supply and leads and stuff, and you might want to buy all sorts of accessories and they do push the price up. But providing you've got basically a USB power supply and a means of connecting it to a composite monitor or, or television, then the chip really does work for $9. Now, I'm sure when you've been watching this video, you've been thinking, the chip, well, that's, that's a competitor to the Raspberry Pi, isn't it, Chris? What about the Raspberry Pi? And I've not mentioned the Pi during this video. But in two videos' time, I will be comparing the chip head-on with the Raspberry Pi Zero, the $5 computer from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And that'll be an interesting comparison to make. Which is best, the chip or the Raspberry Pi Zero? But now that's it for this time. If you've enjoyed this video, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.